What does it mean to be conservational? It explains what it means to carefully preserve and protect something. And these days, you normally hear it in the context of the environment or energy, like you know, the conservation of our national parks or the conservation of electricity. The government and activist groups demand and implore that we do everything we can to preserve and protect these things, but they would, they would never tell us to be conservative in any other way, only when it benefits them. Now, uh, secularly, to be conservative has come to mean that you're fiscally conservative, you know, trying to safeguard the American economy, for example. And there are other aspects where conservatives are fighting in the political arena, like the attempts to conserve human life conserve the nuclear family, conserve our national sovereignty, etc. But what about the conservation of the church? Is anyone doing that? Who is trying to protect the bride of Christ? And who's supposed to? Well, this past week, North Point Community Church in Atlanta with lead pastor Andy Stanley hosted and participated in a conference entitled Unconditional which features several quote-unquote experts and speakers for the purpose of, in their own words, helping parents of LGBTQ plus children and for ministry leaders looking to discover ways to support parents and LGBTQ plus children in their churches. They also say, you will be equipped, refreshed, and inspired as you hear from leading communicators on topics that speak to your heart, soul, and mind. We deeply desire this time will bring about healing and restoration. Now, this next part is important. Pay really close attention to what they say. No matter what theological stance you hold, we invite you to listen, reflect, and learn as we approach this topic from the quieter middle space. Now, what is this quieter middle space, and, and what does that even mean? Well, I suppose that it means that on, on one side, you have a complete affirmation of LGBTQ+, with, at the same time, a rejection of God and Christianity. And on the other side, you have a complete attachment to God with a complete rejection of LGBTQ+, leaving this middle space void of any sort of rejection or exclusion. It's where... LGBTQ plus and, and Christianity somehow merge together. Now, this is where Andy Stanley and this conference exists, in the quieter middle space, where they attempt to affirm both. Now, the conference is simply a symbol of Andy's theology in general and the church network he leads and the progressive church as a whole. This conference caused quite a bit of controversy a week before it was actually held because people began to learn what it was about and that it featured speakers who were not only affirming of LGBTQ plus individuals, but two of the speakers were men who were in gay marriages and professed to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, today, we're not going to do a full discourse on LGBTQ plus and Christianity. But listen, next week, we will. I will speak more about this conference, the speakers, what the Bible actually says, a, a first-hand account of the conference because you can't find any video or audio from the event, and I'll answer the question, can you be a gay Christian? Can you be LGBTQ plus and Christian? So be sure to tune in for that next week because it's becoming a critical question for the church. However, I must say a couple things about the conference or the reaction to the conference in order to make some crucial points. The controversy began with Al Mohler Jr., who is the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and Boyce College. He's an author, a pastor, a speaker, etc., who wrote an opinion piece for World Magazine called The Train is Leaving the Station, referring to Andy Stanley's departure from biblical Christianity. And that really is the focus of our conversation today, the departure from 
biblical Christianity and the inevitable consequences. In the article, Moeller responds to some of the claims and positions about the conference, but then he says this about Stanley. Andy Stanley, one of the most influential pastors in the United States, has been moving in this direction for years, often by suggestion and assertion, but clouded by confusion and the deliberate avoidance of clarity. Back in 2018, he called for the church to be, quote, unhitched from the Old Testament, arguing that the Old Testament should not be understood as the, quote, go-to source regarding any behavior in the church. But, in truth, there goes the entire Old Testament. A few years before that, in a 2012 message, Stanley seemed to argue that adultery is a sin, but told of two men in a relationship with no suggestion that the same-sex coupling was forbidden by Scripture. When the message became controversial, Stanley did not clarify the situation at all. More recently, in another, Stanley, uh, in another message, Stanley dismissed biblical texts against homosexual behavior as, quote, clobber verses, and said, quote, if your theology gets in the way of ministry, like if there's somebody you can't minister to because of your theology, you have the wrong theology. This is not a misunderstanding. This is a, look at this word, trajectory that points to the unconditional conference and two speakers married to other men on the platform. This is a clear and tragic departure from biblical Christianity, and I'm saying the train has left the station, in other words. So, Moeller writes this piece not only alluding to this affirmation and the, the event affirming LGBTQ plus so-called Christians, but also alluding to Stanley's abandonment of the Old Testament, of which he once said, I'm convinced that we make a better case for Jesus if we leave the Old Testament or the Old Covenant out of the argument. So when talking about supposed people who abandon Christianity because, because of the Old Testament, Stanley said this, It's time that we face the facts and unhitch our faith and our practice from some of these Old Testament values that we can appreciate in their original context but we don't really have any business dragging them in to a modern context. He also said, we don't worship the Bible, we worship Jesus. His argument is that Jesus you know, ended the old covenant once and for all, and that, uh, or that Jesus fulfilled the old covenant. Therefore, we don't even need the Old Testament, right? So this was five years ago. The conference was last week on Thursday and Friday. And then on Sunday, so October 1st, Stanley responded to Mueller's article in his sermon. Now, I'm, I'm quoting you some of what he said because it's very important to what we're studying today. Listen very carefully to Stanley's response and his positions, and you can say also the positions of North Point and their churches. Stanley says, Mueller is actually accusing me of departing from his version of biblical Christianity. So I want to go on record and say, I have never subscribed to his version of biblical Christianity to begin with. So I'm not leaving anything. And if he were here, he would say, well, well, Andy, I've never subscribed to your version of biblical Christianity. And that's okay. We can agree to disagree. But this is so extraordinarily misleading. In my opinion, just my opinion, his version of biblical Christianity is the problem. His version, this version of biblical Christianity, is why people are leaving Christianity unnecessarily. It's the version that causes people to resist the Christian faith because they can't find Jesus in the midst of all the other stuff and all the other theology and all the other complexity that gets blobbed onto the message. Bottom line, that version of Christianity draws lines. And Jesus drew circles. He drew circles so large and included so many people in his circle that it consistently made religious leaders nervous. So he's saying a couple things here. 
First, that Mueller and, and anybody that agrees with Mueller, in, including myself, are wrong and that he is right. And secondly, that Jesus was this loving character who exhibited an uncomfortable inclusivity for religious leaders in his day. He says, Jesus drew circles as if to say, Jesus never drew lines. Now later in that same message, Stanley validated the conference as he clarified the position of his church, saying, gay Christians choose a same-sex marriage not because they're convinced it's biblical. They read the same Bible we do. They chose to marry for the same reason many of us do, love, companionship, and family. Now, all that stuff, I'm going to dismantle that, that claim next week. But he also says this, in the end, as was the case for all of us, and this is the important thing I want you to hear me say, it's their decision. Our decision is to decide how we respond to their decision. And we decided 28 years ago. We draw circles. We don't draw lines. We draw big circles. If someone desires to follow Jesus, regardless of their starting point, regardless of their past, regardless of their current circumstances, our message is, come and see and come and sit with me. And this is not new. This is who we are. It's who we've always been. And this is why I love our church. And this is why I'm so extraordinarily proud of you. We aren't condoning sin. We are restoring relationships. And we are literally saving lives. While these excerpts from his message from this past Sunday will serve some of our arguments for next week's show, I want you to see Andy's intention of ministry, drawing big circles. Another way of, of describing that is the word inclusivity. So using his understanding of the Bible, the gospel, and, and Jesus himself, Stanley's approach to ministry for some time has been creating a space that is welcoming to as many people as possible. It seeks to be inoffensive and non-confrontational and stripped of any call to transformation or change or repentance. You're seeing that fulfilled in these two things, like the Unconditional Conference in 2023, the departure from the Old Testament in 2018. But further back um, than that, you, you have Stanley's book, Deep and Wide. This was released in 2012, and it's simply summarized as a, a how-to guide in creating churches that non-Christians, non-Christians, would be interested in attending. The book begins by basically telling the story of how North Point Community Church came to be. His father's church, First Baptist Atlanta, pastored by the one and only Charles Stanley, they could barely handle the amount of people that were trying to come to that church, so Andy created essentially like a sister church. Now, what follows in the consecutive chapters is an explanation of what they did to build a successful church. And tons of churches, I don't know if I can say thousands, but at least hundreds and hundreds of churches followed their example. They're all around us. Now, here's a short list of quotes from this book that was written over a decade ago, which again has served as a how-to guide for countless churches in America. He says, Since people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, people who are nothing like Jesus should like us as well. Now that is just the opposite of what Jesus said would happen to us. He said that the world would hate us because it hated him first but not according to Andy. He also said, we were the only church designed from the ground up to capture the imaginations of unchurched people. He said, we genuinely want to be a network of churches that unchurched people find irresistible. He said, we are unapologetically attractional in our search for common ground with unchurched people. We've discovered that like us, they are consumers so we leverage their consumer instincts. He also said when you read the Gospels, it's hard to overlook the fact that Jesus attracted large crowds everywhere he went. He, meaning Jesus, was constantly playing to 
the consumer instincts of his crowds. Let's face it, it wasn't the content of his messages that appealed to the masses. Most of the time, they didn't even understand what he was talking about. Heck, we're not even sure what he was talking about. People flocked to Jesus because he fed them and healed them and comforted them and promised them things. The book also says, I grew up around people who believed the church was for saved people who acted like saved people. I'm all too familiar with that church brand. The catch was, they were the ones who decided what acting like a saved person meant. And then one more quote says, churches designed for saved people are full of hypocrites. So you can clearly see Andy's prescription for being a successful church. Draw a big giant circle, don't draw any lines, be inclusive, be attractive, do church for the person that isn't even a Christian so that Jesus and the church will be irresistibly attractive, etc., etc. Now, I have to make one crucial point before we move on to diagnosing the much bigger issue here, but in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul is saying goodbye to the church in Ephesus, which he loved, uh, when he says this. He says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The Greek word for church here is ekklesia, which when you break down the word, it's the, the words ek, which it means out from and to, and the word kaleo, which means to call. So altogether, when you put those two things together, it literally means the called out ones. Contextually, meaning the people who are called out from the world and worldliness and unto God. So Paul says that these are the people Christ shed his blood for. This tells us two things. First, that the church, the church, is the group of people who have forsaken the world to follow Jesus, and that the church is exclusive to those people. Ecclesia is exclusive in itself, and the blood of Christ only covers that group. This same idea is expressed in Ephesians chapter 5, when, once again, the Apostle Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And that, that not only speaks to the subject more broadly, but, and, and that we'll, just, we'll talk about next week, but it demonstrates who the church is and who Christ died for, since this is that same Greek word, ekklesia. Now, to this point, I'm I'm only going to speak broadly about the Old and New Testaments to point out that the countless laws of God's people in the Old Testament served, in part, the purpose of separating them from the rest of the world. It was intended to make them as holy a nation as they possibly could be, distinct from everybody else. The Israelites were the special chosen group of people who were given exclusive access to God, providence by God, and protection from God, which nobody could enjoy. Nobody else could enjoy unless they converted to Judaism fully. And then in the New Testament, and at the institution of the New Covenant, which opened the door for Gentiles to become children of God, the New Testament is littered with countless distinctions of those who were repentant believers and those who were carnal unbelievers, unrepentant people who were either attacking the church or attempting to infiltrate the church or wanted nothing to do with the church. In other words, the second part of the Bible never shows one example of non-believers with believers. In fact, here's how the birth of the Christian church was described in Acts chapter 2. Towards the end of the chapter, Luke tells us, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
Now, what you need to notice first is that these people who constituted the first Christian church had all things in common. They shared the same beliefs, and they were spending much time together. And notice that they were growing day by day. So, the question is here, what in the world <laughs> launched this movement, this gathering of Christians, which continues to this day? Well, Peter has just finished giving what is the first Christian sermon, in which he rebukes the audience, rebukes them for their rejection of Christ. And when they ask, after, after being convicted for their sin, Peter tells them in verse 38, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Later, he tells them, be saved from this perverse generation. And after this harsh rebuke and this call to repentance, thousands of people, 3,000 it says, began following Jesus that day. And there was no sound system, there was no light show, there was no music or fog or watering down of the gospel, there was no projectors or LED screens, no concert, no avoidance of personal offense, and no display of inclusivity. Now, I don't know if it was the capitalistic nature of Americans or uh, viewing the, su the success of evangelists like Billy Graham or even outside of Christendom, you know, being inspired by the music industry, or if it was just simple outright greed. But for some reason, at some point in our nation here in America, we adopted this same approach to church that Andy Stanley did. It may be in large part because, because of Stanley. But what did it cost? What did it cost? Our Sunday and, and Wednesday gatherings became and have become completely geared towards the non-Christian. And, and it's produced a consumeristic, secularly inspired, evangelistic event every week. The music... Uh, changed for, for much the same reason. Like classic theologically rich hymns and hymnals were replaced by theologically shallow and repetitive and sometimes nonsensical contemporary music, mainly focused on the rhythmic instrumentation and the booming bass and drums. All of these bells and whistles simply served and still serve as an allurement to those external to the church. And, and not to suggest that this was the, the main mission of every single church, but many churches focused entirely on the week-to-week -week response. How many got saved? How many got baptized? How many were in attendance? How many came back the following week? Church staffs amassed and were treated like corporate office workers. Job requirements had no concern for spiritual matters, only skill and experience. We'll talk about that more next week. In other words, the American church became and, and now is basically like a big business, a, a Fortune 500 company. And just like the, the other Fortune 500 companies, we're progressively embracing wokeness and liberalism so that we can fit in and be liked by everyone else. That's what Andy Stanley has been doing for decades, and that's what the American church has been doing for decades as well. And what does it cost us? What does it cost us to be a lukewarm church sitting on the fence, attempting to have a foot in both the secular world and the spiritual world? What does it cost us to be progressive and contemporary? Because something had to be sacrificed to adapt to this sort of ministry, which really isn't ministry at all. And unfortunately, the this, this thing that we sacrificed in order to do this was discipleship. The American church stopped discipling its members. We stopped training people in righteousness. We stopped holding our brothers and sisters accountable we stopped helping our congregation towards repentance 
and all of this so that every service and every gathering and everything we do could simply be evangelistic. Now, while evangelism is necessary and should absolutely be preached, it was never intended to happen within the confines of the, e the ecclesia gathering. Just check your Bibles. It never shows that one single time. In fact, the example I gave you earlier was Peter giving the first Christian sermon or message, which was evangelistic, and then the church was born. And from that point forward, those individuals didn't need to be reintroduced to Jesus. They had to be taught how to be like Jesus. That's what all of your New Testament books and, and the epistles are. So here, after decades of, of no discipleship, what is the consequence? What is the consequence? We have church members and church pastors that are buried under a mountain of secret guilt from pornographic indulgence. We have Christians who can't put down their coping mechanisms. Alcohol, drugs, shopping, leisure. We have Christians that look and act and sound and think and speak exactly like non-Christians. And we are progressively seeing the adoption of liberalism and progressivism, much like Andy Stanley and his embrace of sinful identities and heresies like the abandonment of God's Word. My point is, the goal of contemporarianism and modernism has beget this anemic church who barely knows the Word of God, who barely practices repentance, and who barely conserves the most important institution on the face of the planet. The church, the bride of Christ. Now, this also has a net negative effect. Evangelism exposes people to Christ, and then discipleship makes them like Christ. When they become like Christ, they individually become evangelistic wherever they find themselves. But when discipleship is removed from the equation, when it's taken out of the picture, no one becomes like Christ, and no one is actually evangelizing. And that results in two deaths. Two deaths. Two things die. The death of the American church and the death of the American society. Because who can evangelize our culture when they haven't been trained? No one is being the salt of the earth and, and the light of the world because no one is teaching them how. Now, Andy says that I just have a different version of biblical Christianity and that we can just, quote, agree to disagree. But that could not be further from the truth. He would like to believe these things to be gray areas or non-issues. Well, then why does Paul say that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God? Why does Jesus and Peter and Paul and John the Baptist and the rest of the disciples demonstrate for us that repentance was the evidence for your authentic belief in Christ, that you had given your whole self over to the Lordship of Christ. The truth is that this is abominable, and we must conserve the church, the bride of Christ, that the family and marriage and all institutions of, of the Lord, which are under great assault in our land. And when we do, when we return to true discipleship, when we do church for the believers, and when we stop trying to be politically correct and progressive and attractive and contemporary, the church will resurrect in America, and likely so will our culture. As a Christian, there's nothing wrong. In fact, there is everything good about swearing allegiance to the American flag. Now, why is that? Because of the virtues for which the flag flies. It speaks to our providential founding and has been for nearly 200 years a symbol of freedom to those who seek it. Now, you can fly the American flag with pride from your front porch or out in the front yard. You can even hang one on a wall in the house, the garage, the office, or wherever you wish. 
I recommend that you get a flag that will last and withstand the weather throughout the seasonal changes of the year. So check out the supplies at Allegiance Flags. Check the link in the show notes or head over to wethefreeshow.com for more. Military and first responders get 10% off all orders.